The following program is made possible in part by the Dayton Bar Association. Good evening and welcome to You and the Law. Uh, I'm Mike Monda, uh, your producer and host of tonight's program, and we are talking uh, with some guests tonight uh, from uh, the uh, world around us here uh, in human trafficking, and that's our topic, very important topic. Uh, we have Ms. Shannon Potts with us. She is with the City of Dayton Law Department. Uh, good evening, Shannon. Uh, good evening. We have Mr. Anthony Talbot. Uh, UD lecturer and co-founder of uh, Abolition Ohio, and uh, Ms. Melinda Sykes Haggerty from the Ohio Attorney General's Office uh, uh, Division Council there. Good evening to all of you. Uh, before we get to our panel discussion, let me remind you that You and the Law is a monthly uh, presentation produced here at the studios of the Dayton Access Television. DATV is on Channel 5. It's the public access uh, of Time Warner here in Dayton. Uh, the program is also cable cast uh, north and south uh, via the auspices of the Miami Valley Cable Council. Uh, check with your guide to see what channel it's on. It's usually on Channel 6. Uh, we're on Channel 5 live right now. Uh, we also stream live at uh, DATV.org. Uh, you can watch the program live there and on demand uh, at, at times afterwards. The executive producer uh, for the program is former domestic relations judge Mike Brigner, who was the founder of this program back in uh, 1988. It's a live call-in show. Uh, you will see on your television screen, if it is live, the number 223-5311 and that is the channel to call in on if you, the viewing public, have a question you would like to have answered by our expert guest. Did I say they were experts? They are experts. So uh, I'm going to uh, now turn to our guests and let them tell you a little bit about their backgrounds and familiarity with today's topic. And we will start with an old friend of ours, Shannon Potts. And Shannon, good evening. Good evening, Mike. I am Shannon Potts. I'm an attorney for the city of Dayton, Ohio. I defend claims for property damage and personal injury against the city, and I handle some civil litigation and the city's liquor cases, which was the cause of my last visit to your show. But I'm actually here tonight in my capacity of ch as chair of the Dayton Bar Association's Public and Member Services Committee. I am not an expert on human trafficking. <laughs> But, uh, on the other hand, you were the facilitator to get our guests here tonight. Yes, I was. The Public and Member Services Committee assists the Dayton Bar Association in fulfilling part of its mission, which is to enhance the public's respect for the law and to promote excellence and congeniality in the profession. Um, so, we put some programming around um, Law Day this year which is a, an annual day that started in 1957. It was the brainchild of a past Dayton Bar Association president, a Washington, D.C. attorney named Charles Rhine. He had this vision that we would have a day where we would celebrate the rule of law in our society and, and how it protects our freedoms as American citizens. So um, from 1960 or 1957 on, we began celebrating Law Day as a nation. So what my committee wanted to do this year was to um, use the American Bar Association's Law Day resources and have some programming here in our own community surrounding Law Day. So that kicked off with something we do every year, which was a Law Day luncheon at the old courthouse in downtown. But after that luncheon, we had a series of three more events, the last one being the show that brings us here tonight. But in the middle, we had um, a couple of other events, and one of those being a book discussion on The Slave Next Door, a book on human trafficking. As you can see, I read and studied this book, and United States Magistrate Nobody Judge... Nobody but you would put all those <laughs> markers in. I do like my colorful tabs. Okay. 
So uh, United States Magistrate Judge Murs um, led the discussion on this book at the Dayton Metro Library Thursday evening. And it was a lively discussion. Um, we scheduled, we had the room for 90 minutes and we were right up to the very end. It's a topic that I think that, um, you know, people are surprised to learn how prevalent modern day slavery is because a lot of people assume that it ended with the Emancipa Emancipation Proclamation and um, the you're, passage of you're the 13th on the Amendment. Lead here. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so as part of um, Law Day this year, we um, studied some statistics on, on human trafficking and, and learned that there, there are estimated, or at the time the guide was put out for Law Day, the American Bar Association got some statistics from the International Labor Organization, and it was estimated that there are 27 million people being human trafficked uh, worldwide. A wonderful contribution. Thank you, Shannon. Um, uh, we turn now to uh, Melinda Sykes Haggerty. Good Hi. evening, and thank you for driving all the way from Columbus to uh, participate tonight. Good evening. Thanks so much for having me. It was a lovely, rainy, drizzly drive <laughs> across 70. Um, I'm the director of Children's Initiatives for Attorney General Mike DeWine, and in my capacity at the AG's office, I facilitate the Attorney General's Human Trafficking Commission. And that group is really a cross-discipline group. It's a statewide group. We have prosecutors, law enforcement, victim service providers, professors, schools, religious groups, just interested community members. And we do a lot of statewide projects with human trafficking. And one of the most recent things that we've been working on is legislation. So I'm happy to be with you today to talk about all those things. Well. Wow. We're looking forward to it. And last uh, but not least, from, from UD, a lecturer and uh, co-founder of Abolition Ohio, Mr., uh, well, you're actually Anthony N. Talbot, but uh, right. Tony Talbot, great to have you with us. Right, thanks a lot, Mike. Yeah, I'm originally from Dayton and then uh, grew up, was born here, lived in um, Greene County and left as soon as I could and somehow got drug kicking and screaming back. I'm very happy. Uh, to be back. I teach over at UD um, in political science and human rights. Um, I also uh, co -found, I'm a co-founder and the chair of Abolition Ohio, which is our uh, anti-human trafficking coalition, similar to what Melinda described at the state level, but here within the Miami Valley. Well, great to have you here. Thanks. Um, uh, Shannon, uh, earlier uh, in her comments, indicated uh, that we're at the 150th uh, anniversary of the, um, what is it, the 13th Amendment uh, being passed and, and uh, the end of slavery as we knew it in the 1800s, but maybe it's still going on now. What's, what's happening? Uh, why are we all here? Uh, is this something the public should know more about and why? Uh, definitely. Um, to steal a line from Kevin Bales, the author of the book that uh, Shannon just showed us, uh, said even though we think slavery ended with the Emancipation Proclamation and the Civil War, but there hasn't been a day in U.S. history without slaves on U.S. soil. Um, that's up till today. If you know your history of the, the Civil War and the immediate uh, post-war period, you know that many of the freed slaves were forced right back to work on the same fields that they told as slaves, only now as freed men, victims of a corrupt uh, legal system. Uh, they were forced into debt bondage. And cases like that, forced labor and debt bondage, continue around the world, around the U.S., even here in Ohio, even here in Dayton. Added to that are forced prostitution, where women and uh, men are forced through force, fraud, or coercion to uh, perform commercial sex for someone else's benefit. And then there's also the, what many people consider to be the most heinous of, of these crimes. Uh, there's uh, minor sex trafficking, where children under the age of 18 are forced uh, into commercial sexual activity. You, you are the co-founder of Abolition Ohio. What is Abolition Ohio and, and what does it do and what are, what are its aims? It's, there's a, it's loosely affiliated to a program under the United States Department of Health and Human Services. Um, it's a rescue and restore coalition. Essentially, 
I mean, rescue and restore victims of human trafficking is the overall overarching idea of it. Uh, we're essentially a group of uh, concerned citizens, law enforcement, uh, social service providers, uh, caseworkers, uh, people from the prosecutor's office, um, et cetera, in the greater Dayton area who come together uh, monthly to build stronger partnerships to deal with this crime because it's, as we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about later tonight, it's a very, very complex and difficult to prosecute crime. But we also work for prevention services to prevent it from happening in the first place. And we also work on uh, protections for the victims, the people who've already been subjected to it. Okay. And Melinda, you have indicated that uh, you're involved in the legislation against this uh, type of activity. What sort of uh, things are we doing up in, in Columbus and uh, how are you involved in that? Sure, well we've been working really hard on trying to figure out how exactly we go after these traffickers and how we take our victims and make them whole again. So we've been focusing on that f for a long time. We passed over the summer House Bill 262 which was called the Safe Harbor Act. And that act was really designed to create a safe harbor for minor victims especially. So that legislation consisted of increasing penalties on traffickers. Trafficking in persons is now a first degree felony here in the state of Ohio with a mandatory minimum of 10 years. So it's a big deal. The other things that that legislation did was provide an abeyance, we call it an abe abeyance procedure, and essentially it's diversion. So when a juvenile comes into juvenile court, if we suspect, if there's any suspicion that that juvenile is a victim of human trafficking, we would hold a hearing to determine whether the child's a human trafficking victim and get that child into services instead of just putting them in detention centers, which is what we, we saw before. Um, it also provided a mechanism for the human trafficking victims to get their prostitution related offenses expunged um, later on so that they could re restore their lives so that people like Tony could help them um, restore their lives and get jobs and things like that. Well, now, from, from what you're saying, are the victims also identified as criminals here as well as the traffickers? Yes. Okay. So that's the really interesting thing yeah. here in Ohio. A victim, depending upon w which law enforcement officer picks that victim up, really could be arrested as a prostitute under prostitution or solicitation statute, or they could get a different response from law enforcement, who would then call one of the anti-trafficking organizations like Tony's and try and get that victim into services. Yes. Okay. So. There's victims, there are traffickers. Apparently, there must be some money involved, or, mm -hmm. or, or else this wouldn't be right. the underground business that it is. Uh, what steps are there to identify victims? What steps are there to identify traffickers? Is, is this something which anybody walking down the street can tell, or um, do you have to kind of um, search underground to find it? I, I think any of us here could talk about this pretty uh, clearly. It's, it's a hidden crime, but it's mostly hidden just because uh, most people don't know what to look for. Um, the first thing to, to really do is to trust your gut. If something doesn't seem right, uh, like take a second look. For example, um, I, I'm going to focus a lot on the labor trafficking side okay. because a lot of times we forget about the forced labor side. We concentrate so much on the uh, commercial sex side. but if you're getting your nails done in a nail salon and there's a young man maybe from Laos sitting across from you who's doing your nails, who's working very hurriedly, who refuses to make eye contact with you, who doesn't speak any English, who has signs of bruises maybe or looks just scared, he keeps looking over his shoulder, there's a, a woman walking around glaring at all the men working or the men and women working and seeming very gruff with them. Um, the, and you're looking around thinking, trying to make conversation, they just won't have anything to do with you at all. Then you look around the place and you see bars on the windows, you see security cameras, a door in the back opens up and maybe you smell cooking and you see uh, cots or sleeping bags on the floor. Start putting this all together and why is this person working so quickly? Why are they in fear? Um, why is, are people living in the same place where they're working? Why is there such high security for a nail salon? And these are what we call red flags. By themselves, each one doesn't you know, mean anything, but when they start adding up, 
maybe this is a forced labor situation where people are being have through fraud or threats or violence have been forced to work here their papers if their immigrant victims have been taken from them they're told that law enforcement and the legal system here is corrupt like it is back where they came from they're afraid there's a, they have to work for a set period of time to pay off a debt that they owe the trafficker and if they try to leave they're subjected to more coercion or more violence uh, that's slavery that's trafficking those seem like fairly I don't know to me I don't go to that many nail salons but right. um, those seem like kind of blatant signs are there any more like subtle things that uh, uh, and, and if a person reports that is somebody going to tell them quit butting in where you don't belong kind yeah. of a thing there's I guess that's and I'm glad you, you said you, that yeah who would you report why that to? thank you Mike <laughs> okay you're welcome there's a national human trafficking resource center hotline okay it's really easy to remember it's 888 three seven three seven eight 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 okay. I know that doesn't sound right but it makes it easy to remember so, and, and those calls are anonymous are those they calls then? are anonymous it, okay. it doesn't go to law enforcement it's a non-governmental organization that runs it and um, it's the Polaris project mm -hmm. like uh, Melinda mentioned and they have the network na nationwide network now to call back if they get a call about something happening in Dayton they know who to contact back in Dayton, which police officers to call, would, children's services. Would they recontact the person who originally called in, or is that just sort of uh, dropped Generally, at that no. Point? Okay. Uh, they don't recontact the person who called in. Um, and it might be, we talked about those signs being pretty blatant. If there's something more subtle, you think something's wrong, you make a phone call, hopefully you're not the only one who's noticed something. So they see a pattern of things happening where three or four or five people have called over the space of the last few weeks reporting red flags in a certain area, they compile it all and they can make it into a smart tip for law enforcement. Now, would you say that, uh, at least in the prostitution area, that a lot of this starts with juveniles? And if, if so, are we involved, and when I say we, I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about my experts and identifying uh, these young people and how they get, get started in it and what are some of the telltale signs there? Absolutely. We do see that the average age of entry into prostitution is 12 to 14 years old. That's pretty young. It's pretty young and you're probably not going to see a 12, 13 or 14 year old standing on the street being forced mm -hmm. to do street level prostitution. So when you're out there on the street and you're seeing this, what appears to be street level prostitution kind of activities, what you have to remember in your head is it's very likely that these women were recruited into sex trafficking as minors. And so we are involved in trying to identify those minor children. Um, House Bill 262 that we passed over the summer was all about trying to identify those minors who are coming into the system either on prostitution related charges or very often theft charges, drug paraphernalia, there's a whole constellation of different criminal activities that could bring a minor into the juvenile justice system that we're looking out for. Now some of the signs, you were talking about signs earlier, so let's talk a little bit about some of the signs that you might notice with a domestic minor sex trafficking mm -hmm. situation. You might notice um, that she has, that the girl will have a lot of hotel room cards. So, you How know, would you notice that? Well, if you see them in her purse or oh, she's got okay. them in her pocket right. or something like that and she's pulling them out and you think, well, why would she have 20 hotel room right. um, keys? She can't even rent a hotel room, right. so why does she have all these keys? If you see them having inordinate amounts of cash for someone their age, um, if you see them with a much older boyfriend, oftentimes that's who's going to be recruiting them into sex trade. If you hear them using language that sounds like it's very sexual in nature or there's a certain slang language that you start to identify, um, tricks, things like that. If you hear them using that language, if you see branding, um, sometimes we'll see across the neck they'll have either daddy or they'll have their pimp's name actually branded right across the neck or a nickname of some kind. Yeah, this isn't something that they voluntarily have done then. 
you right. wouldn't well, think. Even if it is, it doesn't matter by federal Well, law. not that it matters, but I mean, no, what but, I'm thinking is mm -hmm. when you said branding, right. somebody is uh, the, the saying this, of, is, this is our person. But the levels of violence or psychological manipulation that can occur can make her be controlled, or him. We always say her because the majority of victims are female, but male victims also exist. Um, even if the, you say voluntarily, um, one of the things we talk about a lot with human trafficking are the bonds that are controlling the people are invisible. They're primarily bonds of fear and psychological manipulation. And most victims do willingly go with their trafficker, at least initially. Because they think, they think that this guy is their boyfriend. Mm -hmm. So put yourself in the shoes of a minor victim who's already experienced probably some kind of trauma or abuse mm -hmm. as a child. So sh he or she might not have a good um, identification with what's appropriate love. And so the, these pimps know this. And so there's whole books written by pimps on how to psychologically break down and manipulate these girls. So they could spend up to a year making this girl feel loved. Grooming. 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 Yeah. Making the girl feel loved buying her things, becoming the only person she has, isolating her from her family and friends. So once the actual victimization occurs, they already have these trauma bonds to this trafficker. So it, it's, it, it's probably like an L&M movie, I guess, but it seems like it's better than the life that they had uh, at home? Sometimes initially. Um, well, that's what I meant. Initially, yeah. that's the hook. Exactly. That's exactly. The hook. That, okay. Selling them the dream is what some of the pimps will refer to that process as. Right. And these pimps aren't targeting the nice, well-adjusted girl. We'll say girl because most victims are female. Girl with uh, lots of friends. There's who boys, has a, boys in it too, though, aren't Boys are in it young, too. Yeah. Young men. About globally, about 80 percent. By global case law, about 80 percent of all victims have been uh, female about 50% have been children. So there's still a significant amount of uh, boys and men involved in forced labor and in uh, sex trafficking. It's mostly boys, you know, male minors who are involved in the okay. sex trafficking. Okay, we're gonna take a very short break. We're about um, 20 or so minutes into the program to let you know that you are watching You and the Law. We're discussing uh, the topic of human trafficking and our expert guests Tonight, uh, Melinda Sykes Hegarty from the Ohio Attorney General's Office, Mr. Uh, Tony Talbot, uh, lecturer and co founder of Abolition Ohio, lecturer up at UD, and uh, Shannon Potts from the city of Dayton uh, Law Department. Um, we are sponsored by the uh, Dayton Bar Association, which has been uh, founded in 1883. Am I right on that, Shannon? Sounds think, right. I think so, yeah. Um, with uh, many programs, uh, uh, Wills for Heroes is one, uh, a notary committee. Um, uh, we also, if you don't have an attorney, you can call a number, which is 222-6102, and they'll help you find a lawyer. Uh, and one of the reasons Shannon was on with us tonight is she was the director of our Law Day, Law Week uh, program, and uh, was instrumental in uh, uh, putting tonight's program together. And uh, what else? Uh, what else should we know about the bar that uh, uh, we haven't talked about? One of the other things that we incorporated into our Law Week this year is our Wills for Heroes program. Um, Wills for Heroes is a national program. It was inspired by the events that occurred on September 11th and those tragic events led to, to the realization that a lot of these people on the front lines are law enforcement officers, firefighters, didn't have basic um, estate planning documents. And, and our, vo our volunteers help them put those together, first responders, uh, uh, police, fire, and um, uh, our veterans coming back from overseas, I guess. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay, well that's great. Um, now, and, and I'll ask our folks in the back if you'd, we haven't had a telephone call yet, and, and we'd like to get some for our guests. Uh, our number is 223-5311. If you have a uh, question about human trafficking, 
And the reason I say these are expert guesses, they would be able to answer any question that you have uh, about this subject um, and we'll be glad to expound on it. And if we could put, actually put that number, because I don't think everybody's going to remember Unless I said two two three five three one one every f there it is. If we could just leave that there, there's probably some folks at home with questions and they're thinking, what was that number again? So uh, we anticipate your calls. Uh, here's your chance really to uh, find out more about this subject. Which, when we talked about uh, when we talked about this before, I I uh, pled somewhat ignorance in that. Really? All this is happening right around us. Um, how, much, how much is there of this in Ohio um, since, since you're involved in the legislation and the, not necessarily the direct prosecution, but inferentially? Well, what I can say is that we did do an estimated study. And in our estimated study, we estimate that there are around 1,100 minor victims of sex trafficking here in Ohio right now. And I really think that... Are the those the ones that haven't been caught? We yes. talked about the... Okay. Yes. They're just out somewhere. The vast majority of those are just out there somewhere. And we are starting to see, every time we reinforce our state laws, we start to see more identification, more prosecution. Um, we have at least four cases going on right now in the state of Ohio under the new state law that was just passed in June of this past year. We have many, 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 many federal convictions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there a, um, uh, and, and I suppose if there are victims out there who might be sitting around watching this show, and I, and I hope that they are, uh, do you get calls from them ever? <coughs> When we do get calls, Polaris Project does get calls on that national hotline number from victims, and they will give those um, victims, they will connect them with their local anti-trafficking coalitions, like Tony's organization, like Abolition Ohio here in Dayton, who help connect them to the social services in their community and help connect them to law enforcement to see if we can get that victim to testify against his or her trafficker so we can make that prosecution. And, and that's a problem, having people actually right. testify because mm -hmm. they're under their wing and probably afraid also. It's true, but the, the key component of the federal law and the state legislation now, and even the international, legisla or international law guidelines are protection of the victim. Mm -hmm. That's what comes first. These are victim-centered approaches. So if we can rescue and then help restore, rehabilitate a victim, that comes even that, that trumps getting them to testify, especially um, with minor victims. Uh, and, and with the Abolition Ohio program, uh, these victims can find it, come and seek counseling, and, and right. perhaps break the bonds with their we're trafficker. A, right. We're not a, um, a, a nonprofit or a, a, an NGO by itself. We're essentially an umbrella organization. Okay. So within Abolition Ohio, for example, uh, Catholic Social Services, the YWCA, uh, the Daybreak Teen Shelter uh, downtown are coalition members of ours. So we help to coordinate those services to know if there's a minor victim, these people can provide services to them. If they're you know, an adult male or female victim, this is who can go for services. If they're a foreign national or a U.S. citizen, and we help to coordinate those services and provide it. Um, Tony, some of the other organizations I've heard of too are Oasis House, right. Love 146, Stop Human Trafficking. Yeah. Sure. What are these organizations doing and how do they relate within this yeah. umbrella you're describing? Sure, they're all members. All three of those are members of uh, Abolition Ohio as well. Um, Oasis is a really interesting, uh, they're putting together a shelter, a house for um, doing street outreach for, uh, originally it was to strip clubs and to street prostitute to help these women, who we realize often are victims, or at least former victims of uh, trafficking or victims of circumstance, whatever, they don't, they're not judgmental about it. Love 146 is a, uh, an international organization. Their Dayton chapter is really active here. They're primarily focused on sex trafficking. Um, they started out being focused in Southeast Asia. They ha run a home in the Philippines, for example, for uh, former victims and to sort of um, 
get these kids before they become victimized and provide a home for them. And then, uh, so Love 146 Dayton provides a lot of uh, fundraising for those efforts, but they also, a few years ago, really said, hey, this is a huge problem internationally, but it's also happening right here. And it's one of my favorite sayings I always tell my students, the old, it's not original, but you know, think globally but act locally. They started focusing on primarily sex trafficking here within Ohio, within Dayton as well, and getting involved. Uh, Stop Human Trafficking Dayton is another uh, nonprofit that's uh, been around for a few years now, and they deal primarily with uh, awareness in the arts and reaching out to uh, youth to provide awareness and uh, some treatment and art therapy for uh, kids who are, potent who are vulnerable to trafficking. Is, is there a, a profile for the traffickers, or is, or is this just like <laughs> crime lords, or could it be just a couple of the guys in the neighborhood, or, or what? what? I, yes. <laughs> yes, um, all of that. We see um, traffickers who are associated with being drug dealers, having gang activity, things like that. Um, we've had traffickers who are women. We've heard of traffickers, we have in our state traffickers who are parents. There are children whose parents are actually sex trafficking them for money, for drugs, for things like that. So we've had cases where really anyone who's willing to exploit someone else for their own gain can potentially be a trafficker. Kind of like a cottage industry when you don't have uh, something yeah. else to and earn the, money or and what? And add to that, for, so from those individuals or mom and pop, I hate to use that term, these cottage industries all the way up to the really highly organized transnational criminal syndicates as well. well um, I think our audience might find that surprising and the reason I asked the question is uh, you might think it's the Casa Nostra or something um, not don't call me about that um, <laughs> but I mean organized crime well, uh, something from the Godfather. And, and one like of the that. things that we talk about when we think about this, people are starting to have this realization that this is very profitable. When you have a drug, you can use that drug, you can sell that drug one time. When you have a person, you can sell that person over and over and over and over again. And also, if you get picked up with drugs, you're going to jail. If you get picked up and you have a 16 or 17 year old in the car and you've trained that 16 or 17 year old to be terrified of you, to have a new identity, to tell a new story to any law enforcement or any concerned citizen who asks, it's much less likely that you're going to get caught. Yeah, I, I've heard also that uh, uh, <clears throat> some of the traffickers are brazen enough to put these things on like Craigslist or I don't know if eBay would be one. but. A majority, I, I want to say just some, I would say a majority now. Uh, just like everything else, um, they've gone, it's uh, globalization and telecommunications. Um, like Melinda said earlier, um, if you're driving down the street and there's a 13-year-old girl involved in street prostitution, there's going to be lots of calls to the police, lots of neighborhood watch, etc. Um, so that 13-year-old girl instead is going to be being prostituted behind closed doors in what's often called a residential or an underground brothel and the transactions will be facilitated by, through the internet. There'll be an advertisement on any one of uh, hundreds or thousands of commercial sex websites or on Backpage.com or others um, where it, some are very blatant and others are, you know, the, the standard euphemisms, uh, an escort or a model or a date. But these transactions are made, the, uh, the purchaser, the John, if it's commercial sex, I apologize for anyone named John, but um, that's the, the slang term, uh, arranges for the transaction online and shows up at that hotel room, shows up at that apartment, uh, has their sexual transaction and, and leaves. And it's very difficult to, uh, to police this, to see this. On the other side though, it's leaving a record when this is happening. And there's, there are sources now that law enforcement are using to be able to, uh, to investigate these cases. There's a lot of reverse stings or stings that go on where um, people, law enforcement, pretend to be uh, minor victims or pretend to be uh, to be traffickers and lure the Johns, the consumer, the purchaser in. So it's becoming more of an internet type thing rather than a word of the mouth, uh, word of mouth where you just have to know about it uh, in in the neighborhood or something. Uh, uh, there's not as much profit, I guess, in that as there is in uh, uh, 
Well, one of the things you have to understand too is very often these victims are being moved across the country. So mm -hmm. it would be very difficult with word of mouth to get that around. Mm -hmm. So if you go on Backpage.com and you look at the escort services section, you'll see the same girl being advertised one day in Columbus, Ohio for something like, say, the Arnold Classic competition. Yeah. And then you'll see them maybe the next week being advertised in Orlando, Florida. So it's pretty mobile. You can well, just pick up and, right. and move your business. Uh, and that's key both for profit seeking, but also it's part of the manipulation and the grooming we were talking about. You don't want the victims to be able to have any form of social interaction, to form any bonds with anyone other than the trafficker, including it, bonds with poten potentially sympathetic customers. Uh, typically, is, is, there, is there any correlation between people who are uh, youngsters who are enticed into this uh, from a bad uh, uh, background uh, or, or kidnapped into it. Mm -hmm. uh, is it uh, similar or? Um, or it, it is like. Well, like very that. often it's not kidnapping mm -hmm. because it's much more difficult. But we do have cases where girls are kidnapped. One of the biggest cases that really brought this to light here in Ohio was a case out of Toledo where two girls, 14 and 15, were walking to Wendy's to get a Frosty, and they were literally pulled into a van by a pimp, taken into a basement, beat up, raped, um, taken to a truck stop, and said, this is what you're going to do. That's what they were told. So that does happen, but I think more likely it's that recruitment, mm -hmm. it's that manipulation, it's that isolation from everybody who could possibly care about you. Safer for the traffickers to uh, entice and groom then, mm -hmm. uh, gain confidence. Uh, exactly. I hate to refer to Patty Hearst, but uh, Patty Hearst type of oh, those exactly. things. That Stockholm Syndrome does yes. develop those trauma bonds mm -hmm. like Melinda mentioned. And it makes sense. I mean, if you're going to be guerrilla, it's called guerrilla pimping. If you're going to be kidnapping victims, uh, it's very difficult. It's very uh, out in the open. Um, you're going to attract attention. It's much easier to focus on someone who's vulnerable, a repeat runaway, someone who's a prior victim of abuse, someone who has, is doing poorly in school, uh, someone without, uh, who's an undocumented uh, migrant, someone who is uh, addicted to drugs or dependent on alcohol. They've got those vulnerabilities and they're much easier to manipulate and at least initially they go willingly. That's the finesse pimping or Romeo pimping it's often called. Does it seem so enticing that after the victims are rescued that they go back because it's something they know, I guess. It's the bonds to the trafficker mm -hmm. that really keeps them coming back. So it's not necessarily the lifestyle. I mean, who wants to be beaten up and repeatedly raped? You know, these women who are on the streets face a lot of very difficult situations. They're often um, targeted by Johns who want to have someone to abuse essentially. So it's not that that's that's necessarily the enticement. It's really that bond with the pimp. And mm -hmm. even when they they know in their heads that maybe this person's taking advantage of them, it's it's a long process to get them to see themselves as victims yeah. and to understand that. Think of the similarities with domestic violence cases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Someone you have the cycle of abuse that goes and the learned helplessness that goes along in domestic violence or in human trafficking. Okay. We're going to take a very short break uh, to let you know again, if you've stayed with us the whole time, hopefully you're not watching Jeopardy or Inside Edition right now. You're watching You in the Law, and uh, we talk about legal problems uh, in, in our country and around uh, the nation and right here in any town in the USA. Uh, which might affect you and uh, people close to you. We're talking about human trafficking tonight, and our guests are uh, Ms. Shannon Potts. And Shannon, nice to see you again. Okay, she's the city of Dayton Law D Department and a heck of a good golfer, too. Uh, <laughs> and Mr. Tony Talbot, who uh, lectures on this subject at uh, the University of Dayton. And... Uh, uh, bringing this to our attention through uh, Abolition Ohio, of which he's the co-founder, and Melinda Sykes, 
Haggerty, who came all the way down in a rainstorm from Columbus today, and she works for the Ohio Attorney General's office and uh, is inv very involved in uh, legislation against human trafficking. Um, one of the things I wanted to, uh, well, there's our number, 223-5311. Please call if you're watching us uh, live uh, or um, we do stream live at datv.org. So um, one of the things I asked you, and, and I don't know how many of these cases are prosecuted, uh, there is a state statute against this, uh, and um, do the police departments um, spend much time doing this, or do they have to be tipped off? Or So... Ohio Revised Code 2905.32 is our human trafficking statute here in the state. What's the penalties for that? The penalties are very steep. The maximum? The maximum, it's a first degree felony with a mandatory minimum 10 year prison sentence here in Ohio. So we have really elevated this to let traffickers know we are serious here in Ohio and if you get caught, you are going to prison. So one of the pieces of our past legislation required law enforcement training. And Attorney General DeWine, through our Ohio Peace Officer Training Academy, we train all law enforcement in the state. So we've been really ramping up our efforts to train law enforcement. As a result of that increased training, along with the increased penalties at the state level, we have seen multiple prosecutions that are currently in progress right now at the state level. The police, uh, in, in most jurisdictions, if there's a burglary, somebody calls it in. If there's a robbery, somebody calls it in. If there's a shooting down the block, somebody calls it in. Big crowds of people come around. In this sort of thing, how, what happens? Uh, is it like Tony said, somebody sees something and maybe calls the hotline? or? That's exactly how it happens. Someone calls the hotline. I was looking at Polaris Project does a breakdown of the types of calls they get and, and where they got them. And I was so impressed that many of these calls came from an organization called Truckers Against Trafficking. Mm -hmm. And they're truck drivers that keep their eyes open at these truck stops for girls that look young that are being trafficked at the truck stops. That's a very big place where people are trafficked. So um, sometimes the calls come from that. Many times they come just from citizens who saw something that, that looked a little odd. Um, they'll come from law enforcement who are starting to, we had a case where in a certain jurisdiction, law enforcement had pulled someone over and they found drugs on this guy. He had a 15 year old girl who also maybe appeared to be on drugs. And so before they would have just arrested this guy for a drug conviction and said, I don't know what's going on with the 15 year old. It looks a little strange, but not ask questions. We're now training law enforcement to ask follow up questions. And as a result, that case actually was um, prosecuted. Right. I was going to say, ahead. adding to that, Melinda said there's at least four cases going on right now. I have a list right here that we just put together out of media accounts okay. for the past 10 years of over 60 cases in the state of Ohio of official arrests, investigations, and uh, convictions of trafficking. Uh, and the rate is increasing dramatically since 2010 when we passed the first law uh, criminalize, criminalizing trafficking um, and really started increasing the awareness and the training, especially of uh, the frontline uh, you know, first responders, the law enforcement. Yeah, and, and the law enforcement is getting more respons uh, Much responsive more. and Absolutely. receptive right. to it. I'm very happy with what's been going on here within Dayton, uh, with the Dayton police. The chief of uh, police, Chief Beal, is a member of my organization, regularly sends one or two officers to our monthly meetings, and they are totally on board with this, doing what they can to turn things around. They're actually changing the <laughs> prostitution arrests that have been occurring in the city of Dayton for the past year. Um, it's essentially, I'm not the attorney, so correct me if I'm wrong. I can get shouted down real quickly at this table. But it's the same crime whether you're purchasing sex from a prostitute or selling sex as a prostitute, that, that prostitution arrest. And in past and in most areas, it's almost overwhelmingly the seller, the, the, primarily the women prostitute who gets arrested 
and the purchaser doesn't get arrested or the purchaser just gets sent home or is not even uh, gone after, in Dayton that's changed in the last year or so. And now a majority of the arrests have been the men purchasing commercial sex for prostitution. More men being arrested purchasing than women uh, selling because they realize that many of the women who are selling sex are actually victims of trafficking and they're directing them to services. Well, I guess it couldn't happen without a market for it, could exactly. it? Exactly. Now, are those people who may be prosecuted, are they, um, do they know anything more than they've just seen something on Craigslist uh, that they could uh, help out with this problem? Do they have a realization that it isn't just them that's getting gratified and there's more to what's going on? In uh, several cities now, at least three or four cities in Ohio, we have uh, what are called John schools. Okay. Uh, these are nationally, how many is it? Five? Five, Five now, see? That's why you have to ask the AG to mm -hmm. keep up on this. But at John schools, it's mostly their first time offender programs where someone is arrested for per trying to purchase sex. They're sent, and, and there's a lot of different models, but essentially it's sort of a diversion program and they're required to go to a school okay. on the, the STDs, on human trafficking, on the social ills, all the bad effects that most people don't think about associated with purchasing commercial sex. So they begin to realize it's not just a victimless crime, that well, there's a lot of harm that does Right, it's a, it seems like it's a triangular. I mean, there's people promoting the business, people responding, and then the real victims who uh, are, are trapped, basically. And, and when you hear from Johns, I think it's much easier to believe in the pretty woman myth than, uh, than to think that this is a victim. Mm -hmm. So they don't always necessarily know that the girls that they are purchasing are not willing participants. It's much easier to justify it by saying, I'm helping this person out, I'm paying this person. Um, you know, I think we see that even with the men who frequent strip clubs. They, they somehow justify this in their minds. They believe it's um, consensual. Exactly. Mm -hmm. okay. And it can be. I, I don't want to, to blur this too much. Um, I, I'm, I'm not on a campaign to attempt to eradicate all commercial sex, to eliminate prostitution. I mean, what are you, whatever your beliefs are on that, that's fine with me. Whether it's legal it's, some places. It's legal in some places. It's illegal in all, all the U.S. except for a few counties in Nevada. It's legal some, it, you know, in the Netherlands, for example, and parts of Australia and other places. But it can cross the line. It's the idea of cons whether it's consensual or not. Um, trafficking is when it's no longer consensual. When a child is involved or when an adult, through force, fraud, or coercion, is working, selling their body for someone else's financial gain. That's what we really have to root out. And we could debate for hours, and I have, whether how you do that, whether you can do that without eliminating all forms of commercial sex or not, or what the best strategies are. But it, it's like wage law violations are, are bad. But if you go, they, when they cross a certain line, it switches from wage law violations to modern day slavery, to forced labor. And that's really what I think we need to focus on. Is it is it easier to prosecute this type of, and then and perhaps eradicate? I doubt it'll eradicate it anytime soon. Uh, working at it uh, on the Al Capone theory of doing is it a, a attacking the business rather than than the personalization of it? Do you do you think? Well, I don't know about that, but. One thing that you did bring up that I think is important to note for all of our watchers out there is that it's much easier to prosecute right now at the federal level because the Trafficking Victims Protection Act that was passed in 2000 actually defines all minors as victims. So you don't have to prove that force, fraud, or coercion element if you've got minors. We're still working on the state level, and that's what this House Bill 130 in Demand Act one of the big pieces is that it's going to take away the need to prove that compulsion when you have a minor. So I do think it's going to be much easier to prosecute once, if this bill passes. Well, what is the likelihood of that at this point? You wouldn't think anybody would be against it. 
I don't think anybody's against it in theory. I think that it's just working out um, what the best way to go about doing this is. I'm sure there's lots of nuances in the law. Um, but in 2010, human trafficking was not a standalone felony in the state of Ohio. Mm -hmm. And but the Polaris Project, which is the, the run, they run the national hotline, the 888-3737-888 hotline. But they also do the database that, mm -hmm. like Melinda was talking about, where they compile statistics of across all the states, and they analyze policy. And Ohio was ranked as one of the 12 worst states for anti-human trafficking policy in the country, one of the dirty dozen, they called it. Since then, just in 20, the law passed in December 2010, we turned things around, and now we're one of the top 10 states in, in, the, in the country one of the four most improved in the country, and the momentum is there. Uh, I know Melinda was being a little, I guess, cautious, but I have a lot of, uh, uh, I, I'm really hopeful, and I'm, I'm very optimistic about passage of this uh, new bill. But this, this isn't necessarily just a big city activity. I mean, you, you think of maybe New York or L.A. or Chicago mm -hmm. or something like that, but uh, before I said something about any town in the USA, and not characterizing mm -hmm. Dayton as any town, but uh, in smaller areas, it, it's mm -hmm. still uh, uh, taking place. Absolutely. We have a case that's currently being prosecuted right now in Franklin County where four defendants, four pimps, picked up a girl from Chillicothe, little tiny Chillicothe, and told this young woman, come to Columbus with us, we'll party. They got her to Columbus and forced her out onto the street to prostitute. And so this is happening in Chillicothe. And by the way, that's actually the second case from Chillicothe where um, a woman's been recruited from Chillicothe. We heard of a case that was just being investigated in Mount Vernon, Ohio. So this is happening in our small communities as well. Right, and across mm -hmm. the states, I mean, the, according to the FBI, uh, for domestic minor sex trafficking, the top four cities in the U.S. for number of arrests and convictions of minor sex traffickers are Miami, Florida, all right, that sort of makes sense. Portland, Oregon. To, uh, <clears throat> Las Vegas, Nevada, and Toledo, Ohio. Toledo, Ohio is number four in the United States for the number of minor What's, victims what, what recovered. Is it because it's on the lake or near Canada? Because or? it's on the lake, because it's near Canada, because of the excellent interstate uh, infrastructure and transportation inter infrastructure there. I was just there. guessing, actually. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Because of the pockets of poverty and yeah. people vulnerability. Think of what's happened with the um, the auto industry, for example. Mm -hmm. How much chronic unemployment and desperation there is. And Toledo's primarily an origin city, mm -hmm. so people aren't being trafficked in Toledo t at the high levels that we're, you're thinking of. I mean, like taking a couple of blocks over and trafficked, they're being moved on that excellent interstate system all over the U.S. And, and I, I, don't, I don't think we touched on this much, but a lot of, a lot of this is spawned from poverty, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. anything, that's, oh, anything that makes people vulnerable, it's poverty and injustice, inequality, racism. Uh, to truly prevent human trafficking, mm -hmm. which is what the long-term goal of my organization is, um, all we need to do is have universal social justice eliminate poverty, eliminate inequality, uh, we'll, we'll eliminate uh, uh, human Can trafficking. Can we do that in the next three minutes here? We're going to try, not, yeah. but obviously yeah. we have to work on other strategies well, as well. Well, it's admirable that uh, you all are working toward that, and, and you're, it, wouldn't the word be indefatigable to uh, not give up on that? Uh, we've got three or four minutes uh, left, uh, and um, I wanted to reserve a little time in, in case you wanted to... Um, Tell us, you know, what, sh what should the average person be thinking about? What should they be doing? Should they be worried about their own families, uh, how this affects their lives? What do you think? Well, I think it's important to know that everybody has a skill set. Whether your skill set is you can build um, playgrounds or you can build houses or you can quilt, whatever your interest is, you can use that to help human trafficking victims in some way. So I would really encourage you, all of your viewers in Dayton, to get involved with Tony's organization and find out what they need. Maybe it's they're building a shelter for minors and they need somebody to um, run electricity to the building. 
there's something each one of us can do to contribute to our community and to try and reduce those vulnerability factors. Be that mentor for a vulnerable child in your community. There's something everybody can do. Yeah, a lot of cases. A pastor told me once that uh, one of the ways these children are recruited is the only positive interaction they've had with someone is from is with the pimp, is with the mm -hmm. trafficker. Someone said, wow, you look nice today, or wow, you're great. So when you see a child, especially a disadvantaged child, a child who seems to be inward, say something positive. Be a, an actual positive role model or have positive interaction to build up their self-esteem. Um, look for the signs. Anyone, you can Google human trafficking or whatever. I don't want to promote Google too much, but um, whatever you want online, there's f all kinds of information. Internet requests, Bing maybe. Huh? Bing, right. <laughs> and um, if you see something, call that hotline at 888-3737-888. You can call it if you're a victim. You can call it if you want to report a tip, or you can just call it as a citizen wanting to get more information. Um, contact my organization. I can send you towards volunteer opportunities or shoot you toward, shoot you some more information or whatever you need. And you're on the internet at Abolition Ohio? Abolition Ohio, okay. yes. Okay. Um, well, it sounds like we're making progress with a problem that a lot of people didn't even know we had. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, or, or, well, I think we in the legal community do know that. Right. But um, just folks uh, around uh, maybe listening to this program there's our, there's our hotline number, 888-3737-888. Um, if you do see something, uh, call it. And let's ask our floor director, how are we doing on time? We almost, uh, we about ready to, okay. Any last thoughts? I think I got about a minute. They're gonna tell me that we've run out of show here in a minute, but. Uh, it's been great having you, all, yeah, all of you. Great. Thank great. you, Shannon, for, for coming. Shannon Potts. Thank you, Mike. I uh, appreciate it. Melinda Sykes Haggerty uh, came all the way down from Columbus. Thank great you. to have you here in Dayton from the Ohio Attorney General's office, uh, uh, involved in legislation, and uh, of course, uh, uh, Tony Talbot, who lectures at uh, UD on this subject, co founder of Abolition Ohio. This has been a production of You and, uh, you and the Law monthly program designed to uh, bring experts to you, uh, the viewing public, tell you about the legal world around. I'd like to thank all the volunteers behind the scene uh, who have made this program possible, thanking our guests again. I've been your producer and host. I'm Mike Monda. Thank you for joining us. Uh, goodbye and good luck.